Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 186 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at what goes into deciding the price of a charging session. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that next week we're chatting with Sarah Merrick from Ripple Energy about the things they're doing to democratise ownership of wind and solar farms. Also, a quick word to listeners from outside the UK. My stats tell me that approximately one in nine of you are from the US and Canada, so... Hello, uh, let me know if you're looking for any specific US slash Canadian content, and I'll see what I can do. evmusings at gmail.com Our main topic of discussion today is charger pricing. Now, we've covered charger pricing several times before on the show, but those episodes were more focused on what the price was and which charge point operators or solutions were cheaper, or how you can reduce the price of charging overall. Today, I want to look at this from a different point of view. I want to look at what are the sort of things that can go into determining the price you pay for a kilowatt hour of electricity on public charging. Everyone tells me they think rapid charging, public rapid charging, is way too expensive, but nobody can really tell me why that's so. Uh, Those who don't know the details assume it's just because the charge point operators are ripping off the drivers but it's generally not that at all. If we think back to the way petrol is priced, we note a couple of things that seem to be true and constant. Firstly, the price would vary on a regular basis. If we look at the data from the RAC, we can see that over a long enough time period, there's very little consistency about the price of petrol. I've known it go from a pound per litre up to almost a pound 80 per litre, often within about 12 months. Now, obviously, people bitch and moan about that but we never see any sort of vitriol aimed at the garages that are, quote, ripping off the drivers. It's accepted that the price is both high and variable. Nobody takes to social media saying, Shell just charged me £1.54 a litre. Let's boycott Shell until they drop the price to a reasonable level, never using them again. Secondly, the thing that's also noticeable is that when the price changes, it tends to change everywhere. Sure, there are a couple of places, such as supermarket petrol stations, where the price is lower, and the MSAs are usually a few pence higher. But on the whole, if the price is £1.50 per litre, then Shell, BP, Texaco, Jet, Merco, etc. are all on or around £1.50 per litre, give or take. There are places where it'll be a few pences cheaper, but you won't find anyone selling fuel at a pound per litre, for example. But let's compare and contrast that. We charge pricing. Bear in mind, we're talking about electricity which is delivered in several different ways. AC, DC rapid, and DC ultra rapid. But at the basic level, it's the same thing, electrons. So why does somebody like Shell Recharge have a price of 89 pence a kilowatt hour, but with Tesla you can pay as little as, well, around 32 pence a kilowatt hour? Well, let's look at how the price of a kilowatt hour of charge is calculated. The main factor that plays into this, obviously, is the price that charge point operators pay for their electricity on the wholesale market. Naturally, none of the charge point operators will go on record and say how much they pay for electricity. It's something of a trade secret, and it differs by charge point operator. But I'm reasonably sure it's not single amount. I know it's a lot more than some of us pay for cheap off-peak electricity. It's not capped like the domestic rate is, and it also includes additional costs to which we are not subject as domestic customers. If you look at the wholesale price of electricity, for example, it's currently, at the time of writing, around 15 pence a kilowatt hour. A charge point operator can take out a contract to purchase electricity at that price for a set period of time, let's say six months. On the face of it, that would seem to indicate that, with a few pence added on top for overhead, they should be able to charge, say, 20 pence a kilowatt hour to the end customer. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. The wholesale price is merely a starting price for the cost of energy. 
On top of that, you'll have, say, 15 pence a kilowatt hour in non-commodity costs. Uh, these are the costs not directly associated with the price of the energy. And this includes networking costs, environmental and social costs, supplier operating costs, and the supplier's pre-tax margin. Then, a CPO has to pay a standing charge, just like you and I do, as well as what's called capacity charges. Capacity charges are fees to ensure that the electricity you might use is there for you when you need to use it, whenever you need to use it. It's no good having a huge new hub like, for example, the BP Pulse site at the NEC in Birmingham with lots of high power chargers if the power isn't available to run the chargers at the stated capacity. The standing charge at a site used to be similar to what a household would pay, pennies per day. But thanks to the recent Access Significant Code review that came in earlier this year, the cost of major grid up upgrades on the macro network is now passed to all projects via higher standing charges. So a site which used to pay around 25 pence a day will now need to pay 10 pounds per day as a standing charge. This will need to be apportioned out over the average number of kilowatt hours for the site and will increase the unit charge. This might come in at another few pence per kilowatt hour. While amounts charge point operators pay for electricity will differ according to how it's sourced. GridServe, for example, use their own solar farms to supply their network, which allows them to manage the price a little better than some other CPOs. It does mean that every charge point operator could pay a different amount for their power than every other one, depending on the power contracts they're negotiating. But even when you bear all this in mind, you're still only looking at half of the cost of providing a service, the raw electricity. And we spoke with Adrian Keane earlier this season. And in that episode, he told us the following. Not just the unit rate of charging, or the unit rate of power, but also the cost that CPOs bear to maintain those independent power supplies. So at home, you and I will pay a standing charge. Businesses also pay a capacity charge. And all of those costs have gone up in addition to the price of uh, the unit price of electricity. The load on top of that, the inflationary impact, salary increases, the general cost of, of buying goods to support the business. We have fairly material overheads that we need to manage. And this has to survive as a profitable business. So we've tried to set our price point um, where EV charging is indeed competitive, but we can afford to generate uh, an income that will fuel the future expansion of the network. So there are two aspects to charger pricing that we need to be aware of. The price that's paid to get the electricity and the overhead prices that are related to providing the charging service itself. In a recent webinar I attended, a slide was shown which broke down the elements that go into the price of a kilowatt hour of electricity at a public charger. Over and above the price per kilowatt hour that we've just discussed for the actual wholesale electricity, these were payment fees, which are fixed, the overhead paid to third party companies that process payments, hardware costs, fixed, which is the price of buying the charger unit and the associated hardware, installation costs, which are variable, the costs to buy land, dig it up to run cables, build and landscape, tarmac, white line drawing, canopies, etc. Maintenance costs, again, variable, the costs associated with having a fleet of engineers, either in-house or third party, and the hardware needed to keep the units repaired and running. Customer service costs, variable, price of having a team of people ready to answer the call, monitor social media, etc. And this can be outsourced, but there's still a cost associated with it. Data and platform costs, which are fixed. These are the costs associated with running computers that deal with the back end of the charging business, software maintenance, etc. And location rent, which again is fixed, which is the fee paid to a landlord for allowing you to put a unit on their site. This means that if you're buying your, your electricity in advance and including all the factors we've already talked about earlier at a price of X pence per kilowatt hour and you are charging users X plus 10 pence per kilowatt, kilowatt hour to charge, that 10 pence difference has to cover all the other costs in the list above. Now, if you think about this logically, it means that a charge point operator who has cheap hardware only pays by app or RFID ID card and has charges at places where the ground rent is low, they should have lower rates than someone with expensive charges, contactless payment and lots of ground space. This could be why Ubertricity, 
can charge 24 pence a kilowatt hour for AC charging coming in through an existing lamppost charger on a pavement in West London using an app. But Instavolt or As Osprey charging levy three times that amount for DC charging at a bespoke hub site with high powered, expensive hardware and contactless payment. But that does beg the simple question, how can Tesla do it so cheaply? And I think that's a key question to ask. Tesla have lots of installed chargers in the UK, over a thousand high powered ones at the last count. They're in a little over a hundred locations across the country and their units are standard and powerful. So in theory, the charging they provide should be more expensive than a charge point operator who operates, say, a single unit older charger in a supermarket car park, for example. That's not the case. With Tesla, you can pay as little as 24 pence a kilowatt hour for high power charging at one of their large 16 charger locations off peak. And even when it's busy and electricity is expensive, you won't pay much more than about 60 pence a kilowatt hour. Compare this with GridServe at 69 pence a kilowatt hour, Instavolt at 75 pence a kilowatt hour, and Osprey charging at 79 pence a kilowatt hour. In fact, friend of the podcast, Gary Wells, tells me he can actually charge his Tesla for less on one specific supercharger if he puts more than 50% of his charge in there than he can if he uses his 13 amp three pin charger on a five pence per kilo hour octopus go overnight rate for four hours. How ridiculous is that? Now, is it because Tesla is subsidized? Possibly. But why would Tesla subsidize charging for owners of non-Tesla vehicles? The prices I've just quoted you are for the public Tesla app, not the in-car Tesla screen for people charging their own Teslas. Originally, Tesla provided free charging for those people spending almost 100,000 on a Model X or a Model S. The purchase price of the car included an amount of money to prepay charging at their supercharging network. But with the arrival of the Model 3 and the Model Y, and presumably with the alleged upcoming Model 2, this free charging has been removed. The lower purchase price has decreased the amount of money Tesla can use to subsidize the charging. But they still seem to be doing it. Now, I personally think the main reason is because this is being provided as a service, not as a business. If you look at Osprey Charging, Instavolt, GridServe, BP Pulse, and all the other major charge point operators in the UK, and essentially worldwide, they're operating as businesses. They have to run a business model which will ultimately provide them with a return on their investment at the charger level. Tesla don't have that. They don't have a charging business. They have a charger service, which is provided for people who buy their cars. The manufacture and sale of the car is the business Tesla are in. So they don't need to make money on the charging as it becomes an expense at the business level to offset against the income from selling cars. It's a little like when you go and visit a car dealership and they offer you a fancy coffee and a biscuit while they fill in your paperwork. It's part of the service. But when you go and visit Costa Coffee or Starbucks and get a fancy coffee and a biscuit there, it's their business. Now, Tesla has a market cap of around three quarters of a billion dollars. And just to put that in context, if you earned a dollar a second, it would take almost 23 years to earn the amount of money at which Tesla is capitalized. Their latest financial statement showed an income of $81 billion last year, of which it made a gross profit of almost $21 billion. After expenses, the taxable income was $13.7 billion. That's not bad for a company that basically made a loss until about five years back. Again, for context, one of the largest companies in the world is General Electric. They made 1.4 billion pre-tax profit last year on nearly the same amount of income as Tesla did, 77 billion versus 81 billion. So Tesla are not short of money. Also, for context, the last financial figures for ChargePoint operator Instavolt, which were finalized and released in July of this year for the year end in March 2023, showed that they turned over 18 million pounds in sales at their charges, but ended up with an operating loss of 10 and a half billion pounds. Back to Tesla. Is this how they can afford to price their charging so low? Maybe, but we also know that Tesla blocked by a lot of their energy in advance. This is one reason why their charging prices change on a regular basis. As the purchase price changes, 
so does the price that they levy to charge your vehicle. But even with the block purchase of electricity, which must happen on a country by country basis, not globally, can they still get electricity at such a cheap rate that they can afford to effectively charge 32 pence a kilowatt hour for non-Tesla charging? If they can, which I find very unlikely, why can't all the other charge point operators do the same thing? Why can't Osprey Charging or Instavolt, who have both said on this very show that they sell their electricity for more than they purchase it, even though they don't make an overall profit, why can't they bulk buy at rates which match what Tesla are charging? But remember what I said earlier about charge point operators who have cheap hardware, only pay by Apple RFID card, and have charges at places where the ground rate is low. A lot of that applies to Tesla. Their superchargers are cheaper than other high power chargers because they're far simpler. They're effectively just plugs connected to units hidden behind tall fences nearby where all the work takes place. They only use an app to charge. In fact, the app does plug and charge automatically for Teslas and one tap charging for non-Teslas. And the charges are usually located in places where there's not a lot else going on. If you've ever charged at places like the Wokingham supercharger outside Reading, you realize it's literally a square of rough land in the corner of a hotel's geographical footprint. Minimal to, to no facilities, and it's not even tarmac. Instead, they've got gravel on the ground. That's an accessibility issue according to ChargeSafe, but we'll ignore that for now and move on. So they're looking at having some of the less expensive installs in terms of hardware and locations. Although this isn't always the case when you consider the huge number of units at places such as Exeter services that have just increased to 32 250 kilowatt chargers. Furthermore, their margins will be squeezed a little more with the European version of the V4 superchargers, which will have different tech on board to deal with contactless payments. Or is it actually a different method of pricing that's doing this? Tesla were one of the first to pioneer time of day tariffs. If you want to charge on their network at peak time without a subscription on a non Tesla vehicle, you could be paying. Up, up above 60 pence a kilowatt hour. Now, it's still cheaper than most other charge point operators in the UK, but it is a great deal more expensive than their off peak rate of 32 pence a kilowatt hour. Are they using the peak rate charging to subsidize the off peak rates? And if they are, how are they able to charge so little for their peak rate charging anyway? On top of all of this, we have one thing which makes a big difference for public charging, but which has a minimal effect on home charging. VAT. For public charging, this is 20%, meaning that the 75 pence a kilowatt hour being charged by Instavolt is actually 62.5 pence per kilowatt hour plus VAT. Similarly, the 32 pence a kilowatt hour charged by Tesla off peak is actually about 26.5 pence kilowatt hour. Of course, home charging also has VAT on it, but that's at a much more reasonable 5%, which, if applied to Instavolt, would make their charges. 65.6 .6 pence a kilowatt hour, and Tesla's cheaper public rate will be 28 pence a kilowatt hour. As you can tell, there are a lot of knowns and unknowns when it comes to working out how much to charge for a kilowatt hour of electricity. Variables include the purchase price of electricity and the location and type of charger. Other factors which play into this include payment of capital expenditure, licensing fees for front and back office software, as well as payment for things such as contactless payment fees and rent. So the next time you're charging in public and wonder why it's so much more expensive than the seven and a half pence per kilo hour you pay at home, bear in mind you're comparing apples and oranges. And as a German friend of mine said when I told him that analogy, ah, so you will end up with fruit salad. It's time for Cool EV or Renewable Things Share with your listeners. What do you do with a plot of land the size of 28 football fields about 30 minutes train ride from central London. You build houses on it, right? Wrong. Not if the site is home to 5 million tonnes of landfill rubbish, which threatens to spew methane into the atmosphere if you break the underground seal. Instead, you add solar panels to it and you make a 58.8 megawatt capacity power station running off the sun. That's 108,000 panels enough to power 17,000 houses. Building on a landfill increases the cost by about 5% as special accommodation has to be made to ensure the foundations don't dig into the landfill seal. But even so, the cost is about 850,000 
pounds per megawatt hour, which is lower than gas, coal, and especially nuclear. The first 10 years worth of energy at this site has already been contracted out and bought by BT Group PLC. And after that, it goes to the open market for sale at wholesale prices. The best of both worlds here, unusable land being used and renewable energy being created. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV driver search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using ZapMap in car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com I'm also on Twitter at Musings EV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash EV Musings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash EV Musings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've got electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've got renewable. It is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at Musings TV with the words, more than just the price of electricity. Hashtag, if you know, you know. Nothing else. Thanks, as always, to my co-founder, Simon. Y you know, his latest business venture got off to a rocky start. He was looking at providing a start-your-own-farm kit, which included land, cattle, and a combine harvester. The only problem is he's stuck in that limbo point between charging what it costs to provide the kit and priced himself out of the market, or charging what the market wants and losing money at the same time. It's the eternal conundrum. We have barely material overheads that we need to manage. And this has to survive as a profitable business. Thanks for listening. Bye.